Valley in California is the world's most glamorous wine region. A new Eden, vines as lifestyle statement. A place in which nature has apparently been harnessed to provide those who made a fortune elsewhere with the ultimate gratification, a stake in the truly elemental process of wine production. Millions of dollars have been poured into setting this wonderfully bucolic scene with rural palaces and the last word in hobby farms dotted all over the landscape. But all is not well in Northern California, and billions will have to be spent to save this paradise. California's wine industry has been buffeted by natural disasters and human fads ever since its first wine boom in the 1880s. Today's great red wine craze is Merlot. Merlot is actually the most planted grape variety in Bordeaux, where its soft, lush, fleshy character makes it the ideal blending partner for the much more austere Cabernet Sauvignon. In its Bordeaux homeland, it's most famously responsible for Pomerol and much of saint emilion But it's been adopted with a vengeance by American wine drinkers who see it as Cabernet without the pain. The pain associated with the astringent tannins in so many young Cabernets, which can literally tan the insides of your cheeks like leather. In theory, at least, Merlot offers the thrill of Cabernet without having to wait for years for, while the tannins soften. And how could a wine which offers immediate gratification fail here? California's restaurateurs, wine producers, wine retailers, nurserymen, all agree that the one wine that can sell itself, for the moment at least, is Merlot. The first California vintner to fall for Merlot's obvious charms was Dan Duckhorn, a typical Napa Valley resident who earned his money elsewhere in finance and is now busy spending it on his vines, his wines and his sales pitch. When we came to the Napa Valley, we looked at a lot of options and alternatives because of its diversity. Having tasted many of the wines, I became extremely enamored with the varietal Merlot. It tasted great, I loved it, the color was wonderful. So we began a strong campaign to plant it in diverse areas. We planted it on the hillsides, on the rocky soils. We put it in the southern end of the valley to give some fruit to the wines. We concentrated on it wherever we could. The wines that we have made and others have made here from that varietal have been really spectacular. They have shown us that we made a decision that was correct in the beginning. It was extremely risky. There weren't very many Merlot uh, vineyards planted. So we worked very hard with the growers, and the result has been, I think, a great diversity of wine and a tremendous chance for uh, longevity. They age well, go with a great variety of foods, and we're quite pleased with uh, what we've done. As well they might be. This looks pretty close to paradise to me. In the Napa Valley, it's quite diverse. It lends itself to a lot of outdoor entertaining, which we do. Um, and I think uh, many of us don't leave. We, we travel, we have to. I'm probably on the road a third of my time. 
and I can't get back here quick enough. Well, it uh, has fantastic weather, beautiful weather. Uh, it has the added uh, romance of the wine tradition and the wine growing and wine making tradition. It's but an hour away from a wonderful city, a beautiful city, attracted by you know the, the aspects of good living that the Napa Valley, uh, you know, find food and find fine wine. And I think really three, four thousand years ago, there were many uh, happy people living here, uh, various uh, Indian tribes that found this a very uh, benevolent place. And it just was a great decision that I made, you know, those 15 years ago. In the boom years, everybody prospered. The magic combination of wine and culture, so close to San Francisco, brought tourists in their droves, who demanded greater and grander diversions. This is the Hess Winery, but it's also an art gallery. There is no distinction between art and industry here, but both have been hit severely by recession. Northern California's not just been visited by hard times, it's been bitten by a bug, Phylloxera, a vine-eating louse. Paradise has a price, and the price has dropped, as real estate agent Jean Phillips knows only too well. The original entrance, so that first gate will be eliminated, and. Um, I will need you to sign these documents before we can close the escrow, so I will fax them to you for your attorney's approval. I have to show you my favorite property in the Napa Valley. I, I know you have other questions, and if you'll just indulge me one second, I'll give you a peek at what I think the ultimate Napa Valley estate looks like. This house was built in 1876, and it was bought by a local winery family, and they totally renovated the property about 30 years ago. So that's an original building. Everything else you see has been added on to fit with it. This is a guest house. There's a lighted tennis court behind it with a viewing pavilion, swimming pool, fabulous gardens. There's a lake in the back. There's a gazebo, an outdoor dance stand, there's eight acres of Merlot, and there's their own winery. This property really has it all. And it's for sale? It's for sale. For you only today, four and a half million dollars. In any other market, I think this would have been listed immediately and sold at around six million dollars. So I think it's kind of indicative of the times. I think uh, this is the best time I've seen, and I've sold property here since uh, the late 1970s to really buy your dream property at what I would consider a reasonable price. Why is so much up for sale? Almost every winery here is either selling off some land or they are trying to sell off a home site or using some creative method to raise cash to replant. Because you have a vineyard yourself, I do. don't you? Mm -hmm. Which is hit by phylloxera? Oh yes, since <laughs> 1990 I have replanted almost every vine and there's 13 acres that this harvest after the Pinot Noir comes out will be dirt and it will sit there dirt for a while. So. There is more land sitting absolutely dirt at the moment that people are not replanting than I've ever seen. When phylloxera hits, it hits hard. You lose not just your crop, but your vines. The louse systematically chews its way through an entire vineyard's roots, unless they're a special phylloxera-resistant sort. There's no cure, and Californians are burning everything just in case. In other regions, they'd phase in healthy vines, planting them between the diseased ones. The Napa way, though, is to go for a dramatic purge. So much neater. How did it happen? Because Napa Valley wine has typically been made by people with more cash than experience. They've tended to be much keener on, say, label design than getting their shoes dirty. These well-heeled wine producers looked for advice and got it, ready packaged from the University of California at Davis. The university recommended a rootstock known as AXR1. With its heavy crops, it seemed like manna from heaven. No one took too much notice of the French, who warned it had low resistance to phylloxera. Napa man had nature licked. Now there's a plague on their land.
Okay, here's all of this yellow mm. is a band of of phylloxera eating. There's some. It's tiny, actually, tiny. isn't it? Yeah. Just the end of a pinpoint there. All of these nodules here are where they've broken into the root and fed. This is what interrupts the, the uh, flow. And each one of these little nodules will have a group in their dining. So that's the infamous non phylloxera resistant AXR1 rootstock, is that it? That is the phylloxera resistant AXR1 rootstock. Non phylloxera resistant? Well, it's non phylloxera resistant. It was sold to us as resistant. In 1968, I believed it. The reason why we planted that rootstock is because it was fairly productive and it gave us wonderful wines. Look back for 25 to 35 years, we, we received tremendous wines from that rootstock. So we were languish, languished in a happiness of euphoria and didn't want to change. What proportion of vines in California have been planted on AXR1? 80 to 90%. Probably the worst case is that we planted all one type of vine, uh, the rootstock that, uh, in a, what we call a monoculture, where everything's the same. It allows for the chance of that particular little louse to uh, take hold, mutate, and, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, begin destroying the vines. Uh, we knew about it all along. We probably were not prepared as we are today. When did the authorities realize that AXR1 was going to be dangerous and offer a dangerously low resistance to phylloxera? Prior to 1980. Before 1980? Yeah. I mean, uh, we as farmers knew that we had a, a problem. We hadn't identified the problem completely. Uh, but we knew we had a bigger problem. We knew um, that AXR was not the rootstock that we thought we had. What are relations like at the moment between growers and the university? Uh, those who have acceptance um, are out on their own. Those who are still in, in denial are running to the university asking them for them to come up with a magic bullet. There's no magic bullets. France had its own phylloxera epidemic a hundred years ago. The French wine industry was saved, ironically enough, by importing Native American vines, which are resistant to phylloxera, to provide rootstocks. Most wine made anywhere today is made from European vines grafted onto American rootstocks. The French tried AXR1, but dropped it like a hot potato when phylloxera seemed to like nibbling it. This is Merlot land, east of Bordeaux. Merlot's the main grape in red Bordeaux, or claret. Cabernet Sauvignon may be a more famous grape, but it won't ripen reliably here. Merlot's a bit of a tart that will bed down anywhere. At the heart of Merlot land is saint Emilion, the region's one real tourist attraction. It's almost a Disneyland version of a French town. In fact, it was the English who built much of it 700 years ago when they ruled this part of France. Little seems to have changed since then. The streets are probably cleaner, but the place is still crawling with Brits. There are nearly a thousand wine farms, or chateaus, within four miles, and wine pervades every nook and cranny. Saint Emilion is a small town with 600 inhabitants, no butcher, but 94 wine shops, and the number's still rising. A few years ago, there were only four. Next year, there could be 100 wine shops here. You can't buy a pork chop in Saint Emilion, but you can hardly take a step along a tourist route like this one without being pestered to invest in my cousin's chateau this or my brother's chateau that. If Merlot is king here, then this is the king's physician. 
Michel Rolland of Pomerol is called in by worried wine producers who want to get the very best out of their property. Such are his magic powers and refreshingly hedonistic attitude to wine that consultations are sought far and wide, and he could barely spare me a minute between appointments. Uh, I, I, we, we are maybe seven or eight people in the world to do this type of job, uh, to, to, to give advice uh, about philosophy of wine and to understand vines, to understand uh, vinification for each uh, kind of grapes. We, we are really uh, a small amount of people to do that. Today, Michel Rolland's paying a house call on Chateau Lamond near saint emilion It's been bought by a large conglomerate. The firm's pumped money in and put a businessman in charge. He's been told to make a profit in five years, and the simplest way to do that is to hire Rolland to flesh out his Merlot into the super-ripe, oaky style beloved by the powerful wine critics. I try to find the best way to improve the wine, not to make wine, because people know to make wine. But to improve the wine is uh, uh, a lot of small things who can change the final result with a little difference. You know that in tasting you have a lot of good wine, but sometimes there is a big wine, the great wine. And why? Why? The, the result is better than the neighbor because uh, we, we, we have done the maximum. And I try to find the maximum. How many people have asked you to help them with their wine? It's always a bad question because uh, my client thinks I have too much, but... <laughs> <laughs> Siri, truthfully, tell me, how many clients do no, you have? Uh, it's very clear. In France, I have uh, exactly 41 and uh, outside fi uh, 15. This is uh, 56 total. It's not a big uh, quantity, but well, very good. <laughs> Whereabouts are your clients? Uh, uh, United States was the first uh, country where I, I went to, to, uh, to give my advice. And now uh, Chile, Argentina, Spain, Italy, Morocco, Hungary, maybe next month India. <laughs> and uh, I hope my first client on the moon. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say when people accuse you of exporting Bordeaux's secrets around the world? I, I, I am like, uh, like a doctor and uh, I give advice and never the same because uh, uh, advice in Pomerol are completely different as, uh, uh, as Argentina or California and I am like a doctor. Not, there is no secret. For, for one, uh, one type of wine, there is a particular advice. I need to understand that. For a long time, the average Frenchman's been really quite ignorant about wine. Yes, uh, it's uh, very complicated, I think, because French people uh, think that in France everybody know wine. And, uh, I, and with that, they don't read... Uh, much about wine and uh, everybody has a uncle, as a cousin, uh, owner of vines in, in south of France, in southwest, and everybody knows wine. And nobody knows, really. It's true. Most Frenchmen wouldn't know Merlot from a hole in the ground. But if the French have been so overexposed to wine, they're almost unaware of it, Americans were completely deprived of it and all other alcoholic drinks during Prohibition from 1918 to 1933. Many people alive today can remember when alcohol in any form was illegal and had to be destroyed. Even now, Americans can't buy themselves a glass of wine until they're 21. Parts of the country, although certainly not California, are still completely dry. The most constant reminder American wine drinkers have of continuing official paranoia about all things alcoholic is this, the government warning label. 
which all wine bottles have had to carry since 1990, including these first growth Bordeaux, even Chateau Lafitte at $145 or £100 a bottle. According to the Surgeon General, women should not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy because of the risk of birth defects. Consumption of alcoholic beverages impairs your ability to drive a car or operate machinery and may cause health problems. Well, the second bit's fair enough, but the pregnancy bit's wildly overstated, and it can cause months of needless worry and guilt to women who inadvertently drink without knowing they're pregnant. What I want to know is when are they going to add down here a glass of wine a day may reduce your risk of heart disease. But why do you have your, your government warning label in Latin? Well, I was so outraged by the government warning label because it implied that sulfites was a new phenomenon, a new additive, and, and in fact, um, sulfites and, and the use of sulfites in winemaking is thousands of years old and, and partly a, process, a part of the process. So I thought if you had to warn people against what is basically a totally natural food product that one should remind them that... Uh, Wine has been a wholesome food product since certainly the time of the Romans and before, so I thought we should be careful to, you know, allow people uh, who speak Latin. It is very misleading to force wine uh, makers, especially who don't use uh, additives, who farm organic uh, agriculture, to give the implication that there is some sort of an additive, which there isn't. A moderate intake of alcohol prevents heart disease, by as much as 50%. I mean, this, this is, is the TV program that changed everything. I mean, there is no other drug that's being so efficient than uh, a moderate uh, intake of alcohol. The evidence of the benefits of alcohol in moderation keeps growing. As part of After this broadcast, study, red wine sales soared in the United States as little old ladies tottered into wine stores to buy their heart medicine. Five years old, ...and found that those who drank light to moderate amounts of alcohol had a 25 to 40 percent less chance of developing heart disease. Report after report confirms the truly heartening news that people who drink red wine in moderation live longer and surely happier lives than teetotalers. It's the grape skins that do it. And this is called a hydrometer. And this just In the California wine industry, a group of women, women for wine sense, have got together to de-demonize wine by showing it as a natural, down-home farm product like any other. You think these grapes are ripe? Yes. They're certainly getting heavy enough, aren't they, Devin? <laughs> Well, okay, so when it, what, what do I do now? What's it called when I go to pick the grapes? Harvest. Harvest time. So we're just going to harvest these grapes. Y you didn't want a haircut today, did you? No. No. So we'll just harvest the grapes. <laughs> Put them in our picking bin. You guys seen a picking bin before? Yeah. To combat America's prohibitionist urges, California wine producers have deliberately played up wine's civilizing role at the table to distance it from those hoodlums drinks, beer and liquor. But Fetzer, America's sixth largest producer, has gone one step holier than thou by beating an organic drum. Their most successful venture is a five-acre organic fruit and vegetable garden, but so far, less than 10% of the wines they produce are made from organically grown grapes, despite their publicity pitch and grandiose aims. We have a commitment that by the year 2000, all of the grapes in California will be grown without herbicides and pesticides. That's a very, very big vision. All the grapes in California? All the grapes in California. So it's not just about us, it's about making a difference in the environment. It's about making a difference in agriculture because we feel strongly that if, if this works, and we believe it is, it is working, and we're seeing it work, we're seeing people change, that other industries will then see, oh gosh, that's what the wine industry is doing. Well, maybe we can do it with our lettuce, or maybe we can do it with our tomatoes, or maybe we can do it with our peaches. They're also very keen on recycling. Barrels are dutifully scraped before reuse. Irrigation water reclaimed from an ornamental lake. Corks are shipped in bulk from Portugal to eliminate wasteful packaging. 
foils are fully recyclable, although I'm not sure who goes around the country collecting them. Their inks are reassuringly non-toxic, but perhaps what FETs are best at recycling is information about their recycling. Our philosophy is, um, I, I would use the term maybe more holistic. We look at all of the different aspects of the business. We look at how we interact with our people, how we interact with our environment, and how do we, how do we make money while we do all of that at the same time. Quite. Fetzer, are incidentally are banking on Merlot being the new Chardonnay, being easy to drink but red and therefore healthy. This is some fresh sage um, too. They're also very hot on the art, or is it hocus pocus, of finding the perfect food for every wine. I'm all for the research. I just wish they wouldn't be so damn earnest about everything. Oh, no, that's interesting. Work? What happens is your mouth explodes with the herb flavor and then followed by the Chardonnay fruit. It's great. One thing I love about wine is that it leads so naturally to eating great food like this. Wine's made for the table, and this is one part of my job that I don't object to in the very least. Another thing that makes wine special is that, like books, it's so closely associated with the concept of authorship. Wine's one of the very few products that you can pick off a shelf for not very much money. And just by looking at the label, you can find out where it was made, exactly where it was grown, and when it was made. In fact, it's quite possible to conceive of wine production on a small scale, quite unlike here at Fetze, in which one person is solely responsible for the primary production, for the processing, for the packaging, for the marketing, even the selling. Perhaps that's why so many of us dream of owning our own vineyard. But you know what they say about making a small fortune in the wine business? The only way to do it is to start with a large one. <laughs>